Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Portsmouth Basketball Podcast. I'm Muck. Hello, I'm Paul. And I would say we've got another guest again, but he hasn't moved. We have the same guest. We have the same guest. He's the just same we can't Portsmouth get rid of him. legend, Mark. Can't get rid of him. The same former Portsmouth smuggler, former Reading Rocket, former Team Solent, former Solent Kestrel, former Southampton, former Solent Stars, current GB Maxi. I mean, I could keep going. Is there anything else that we've left off the list? Well, we're going to have to ask him. We're going to have to ask him. I, I probably have. I prom, I prom, I'm probably halfway through the list. Halfway through? I reckon. Do it. Okay. Here Give we him go. an intro. Yeah, yeah, now. now. Stand, Stand and cheer. cheer. For your, for your former Portsmouth smuggler, smuggler. Edgar. Edgar. Number Number six. six. Ryan. Ryan. That was a good one. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. That, that was, might have been the one. best one I've done. <laughs> it's all about you. <laughs> it is. Don't want, right, that's so you can go now, Ryan. He's, <laughs> he's done his bit. He's happy. Welcome back, Ryan. Thank you. We don't validate parking, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you might obviously rec- recognize Ryan from the last podcast where we talked about the force um, when they took on the Kestrels. But in this episode, we want to delve deeper into Ryan's basketball career inside the mind of the legend known as Ryan Payne he's going to share something with us today I can feel it uh well you know what the thing I always think of with Ryan is his basketball IQ is right up there how often do you think about Ryan quite often (laughs) it's just gone weird isn't it yeah absolutely (laughs) you did that oh wow right so Ryan I mean one of the things I wanted to bring up first, because I've tried, I don't know if Mark overheard us talking about this, but I just want to throw a surprise out to Mark is, you know, some of the stuff, as well as a player, you're a coach as well. Yeah. And I think one of your achievements is coaching a former NBA player in Joel Freeland. Uh, yeah. So um, I was the assistant coach of the Solent, would have been Solent Stars under 18 team when Joel came across. Um, so we'd we'd gone to a coaching clinic over the summer and Joel, it was a new, it was a North Carolina Tar Heels uh, coaching clinic up at Crystal Palace. And Joel was there. Uh, I'm not sure who he was playing for at the time, like a local Surrey team from where he lives. And um, one of the coaches at the clinic had got him up to demonstrate a jump hook basically and uh, so I was there Bev Guyman was there um, and we went up and spoke to him after the after the, the clinic and just sort of said who you're playing for and you know that and he basically said I'm not committed to playing anywhere. I've only been playing for like a year locally I used to play football um, and then Bev started to work her magic as Bev used to do and was sort of talking to him about possibly coming down to Kestrel or to to Solent Stars as it was at the time. Um, And essentially wanted to introduce Joel to to her husband, Jimmy, um, because we, we, you know, Jimmy at the time was a really good big man development coach. And we thought that he could, you know, be a really good player it was evident that he was you know he had loads of talent he was big he was coordinated um but we had no real realistic idea that he would come and play for us because he lived in i want to say farnham or farnborough at the time i can't remember one of those towns in surrey and um uh yeah so i'm just looking at his stats 6 11 248 yeah, so pounds so he wasn't that big at that point he was probably about 6 9 he was still growing. Oh, um, tiny. Yeah. Um, but he'd only been playing for basketball for about a year. So, How old was he at that time? He would have been 17. Um, Funny, isn't it? It's like 17, six foot nine, and he's only just started playing basketball. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think his, his dad had sort of pushed him down the football route, and then he'd, 
I, I want to say he had an injury or something. He stopped playing football when he kind of turned it. So, someone obviously said to him, you're massive. You should play basketball. <laughs> um, and eventually we uh, we got Joel and his parents talking to Jimmy. And uh, Jimmy did his normal thing of basically telling a player his life story um, before he even really got to know him. So essentially all of the local teams had been telling Joel, oh, we want you to come and play for our semi-professional Division One team or you know, we want you to be a practice player on our pro team, that kind of thing. We're going to pay you £200 a month or something. You know, you know it was just really low-level semi-professional basketball for a, for a kid and he was quite interested you're amazing you, you, you've got to come and play for us and Jimmy said you're a really big local league player <laughs> um, you could be you could be a, a you know a European pro you could be a really good basketball player but you just don't have enough fundamentals to, to get to that level yeah and it was so I was kind of there at that meeting and it was the, the step back of oh well, this is the first person that's actually said this to me um, because everyone else was just blowing smoke up him um, and I think Rob Freeland Joel's dad really appreciated that um, and kind of convinced him that you know what this is the place for you this is the guy that's gonna gonna turn you into what you want to be because at, at the time he, he wanted to go to you know college in America or he wanted to he wanted a professional basketball career and a real professional basketball career that's, yeah he removed the BS out of it didn't yeah. he yeah um, so you got someone who's telling it to him straight yeah um, and then you know within probably a few weeks he was showing up to our practices and just wow on everybody with ridiculous dunks and just how strong and coordinated he was because because normally you get guys that big, they're clumsy, they don't yeah. have great footwork, they don't know where where their body parts are. Do you know what I mean? You, you understand? And he was just not like that. He's just really coordinated. And then the other thing, you, they tend to be weak on their feet, and he wasn't. He was just he was just solid. You know. Are you looking at players like that at that point? Going, you could be NBA. Oh, we never. I, I certainly didn't at that point. Maybe you know, Jimmy's such a incredible basketball mind. Maybe he thought he had the capacity because of the size and the hands and the coordination. Maybe he thought he had the potential. But I, I thought that was a not a possibility at that point because he's so late to the game. So what is that? If you say that he's so late to the game, and obviously being seventeen, six foot nine, yeah. When. If he, if he rolled back with his age and size, when would his fundamentals would have benefited in kicking in, for example? I mean, obviously, we all want kids to uh, learn or play it as early as possible, but is there, do you think, an age where you go, up until like 14, 15? Because you could be, I won't say only, but you could be like 5'5", five, five, and then suddenly just yeah. start shooting up. I don't, I mean, I'd love to have seen Joel pick up the game at 14, 15 and see what that development with Jimmy, with the footwork, with the techniques that he, he just hadn't learned, what, what that could have translated to, you know, because he was a, you know, he didn't, he wasn't a starting five kind of player in the NBA, really. You know, he was a, you know, he was a valuable piece for that Portland team, but, he, you know, I think he probably, if he'd have had the development earlier, he probably could have been more than that. Probably could have made a lot more money. Um, in terms of when I knew he had the potential, that's probably a really good story. So, because at junior junior basketball, we only had two practices a week, and Jimmy was very much like, it's not enough. You need to be in the gym so much more than that. So, he would... Jimmy would go and meet Joel at a court and Joel would drive down from, well, his dad would drive him down from Surrey and they'd meet Jimmy for one-on-one -on -one coaching every weekend. Um, we had the two practices a week and then pretty much every other week we used to train, we used to go to the um, Solent Stars had a Division One women's team that was really good and we used to play against the Division One women's team on a Thursday night and just scrimmage against them. 
and they had a couple of European girls that were quite tough and you know played professionally in Europe and they were they were decent but obviously Joel was just so much bigger and stronger than everybody and we were a pretty good under 18 team but I just remember and you guys probably know this like if you've ever played against women like under 18 like boys are very sort of careful about what they do what they don't want to touch certain places that you would normally if you were playing defense yeah. playing basketball and so we went through the first quarter and I remember Joel got like three dunks we used to run this this play to get him open into the key and he and he caught the ball three times in a row and he dunked it and they the the division one women's team called a timeout and I've told this story to a few people before and um it was a like silent gym and all you could hear was the coach down the other end saying don't let him don't let him catch the ball in the in the paint bump him foul him you know grab him do whatever you've got don't let don't let him and we're you know this shouting at the other end of the court and we're in a, a timeout and everyone's kind of looking around and Joel looks at Jimmy as if to say are you going to do something about this they're going to try and foul me they're going to try and hurt me and Jimmy's like what are you looking at me for and then we went out and we ran the same play again. Of course, Joel gets the ball and they grab him. Ball comes loose. They go down the other end. Joel's kind of looking over at Jimmy. And Jimmy just shook his head and said, I'm not going to help you. You've got to figure this out for yourself. And then we came back down the other end. And the ball came into him again. And they and they literally three, four girls all piled out and grabbed him. And it, it was like Team Wolf. <laughs> You know, when they grab him <laughs> and he goes down, <laughs> like Michael J. Fox goes in the ball and then he comes up as the team wolf and he's just slinging people off of him and everyone jumps off. It was like that. He just, <laughs> he's got up, had the ball, three, four women fall on the floor. He jumped up, slammed it and then stepped over one of them <laughs> and then walked down the other end of the court. And I looked at Jimmy and Jimmy just shook his head and put his head down and didn't say anything. And I was like, this kid, this kid could be something. Because yeah. there's not many 17-year-olds that would do this. We've been invited into their session. And that's when I knew there was there was something about him. <laughs> Did the step over. I mean, Oh, well, it was it was classic. It was classic. It's you know, I've probably Ty Lu knows about them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I hope but it was like the, the voice. It was, it was literally like that. It was, you know, stand up, just dispense three, four women, <laughs> dunks the ball, and they're looking up at him off the floor. And needless to say, they didn't do that to him uh, again. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, but yeah, he was, uh, you know, really competitive. How long he, was he at the Trailblazers? Oh, I don't know. He was, he was, a few he was years. there for nine years uh, by the looks of it. So I, I remember when I met Ryan, you were talking about him then, um, but he was uh, with Malaga, I think. So he was in yeah. Spain and he was doing really well. So Spain, the I think he got Rookie of the Year or something like that. So, so the year, it wasn't Rookie of the Year because he played for Gran Canaria before that. So he he left us. He, so the, the, the summer after that season... He went to the European Championships um, for for England. Would have been England under 18s, and he had a really good tournament. and he And he played against some some NBA prospects there, and he was he was highly recruited at that point. Um, but his grades for school weren't that great, um, which made him difficult. He had NCAA Division One teams trying to trying to sign him. Um, and I mean, I, I've seen recruitment letters from some high, ma you know, high major Div One teams, but they just didn't have the grades to, to to go. And he ended up going to the Grand Canaria Basketball Academy, um, where he played for like a, a lower division Spanish team, with the idea that he could sit the bench or possibly step up for the ACB Grand Canaria team. And I, I don't think he played much for the ACB team that year. But then the year after, he started to break his way into the team. And then soon after that, he went to, well, I can't remember which year it was, but he got drafted while he was still there. Got drafted while he was still there. 
Um, we stayed up and watched the draft at Jimmy's house. He went number 30. He was the last pick in the first round. Oh, wow. That was, um, that was at the time when Phoenix was really good. Steve Nash, Sean Marion, Amari Stoudemire, and they were playing that run and gun basketball, seven seconds or less. And basically their scout turned around and said they didn't have a first round draft pick. They had, I want to say they were picking like 35 or something like that. And they, they basically turned around to Joel's agent and said, if he if he falls to 35, we'll, we'll take him. Because we need a big guy that can run, jump, shoot, um, and defend. Um, and they were going to take him. Um, but they said there's no way he's going to fall to 35. They're like, we're absolutely sure he's going to... I could be wrong with 35, but it was early in the second round. Um, and it, he ended up going to, to Portland in a really good draft, to be fair. Where um, dreams go to die, says Mr. Lillard. Yeah. It's uh, it's funny, isn't it? Funny team. Yeah, well, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure he got drafted in the same draft as LaMarcus Aldridge. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. They're, 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 Portland are a funny team, aren't they? Because they, they, they've always been there. But they just don't have that step to go up. And you think where they were. And then they have... Um, well, they had Seattle above them. Yeah. And then they lost that with the rivalry. And you know, Seattle were always the, the trump card for them. Without a shadow of doubt. Yeah. I mean, when, when Portland drafted him, he he was a prospect. They left him in Europe for a, a few years. He ended up going to Malaga. And with the yeah, season you're right. talking about, when he went to Malaga, he was the leading scorer in the EuroLeague that year. But wow. he was under contract for the Portland Trailblazers. Yeah. yeah. I, just, I can see that here. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And then he, he went to Portland. Because I remember that's when I met you, you were talking about him and he was in Spain. Then all of a sudden, bam, he's in the NBA. And it's like, yeah. oh, wow. Yeah. Because, um, you know, at the time, NBA teams were doing this a lot. They were they were selecting guys, you know, young guys from Europe and leaving them over there to yeah. develop and then, and then bringing them over when they were ready. Um, and a lot of people in the UK thought that he wasn't ever going to be ready. Uh, he, he, he was too late to the game. Um, but he worked really hard at Gran Canaria. And then, he, he I mean, he was a dominant player for Malaga. Um, yeah, he was really good. He was one of the best players in the Euro League that year. Um, and then Portland couldn't wait any longer. They they took him. So that's that's nine years total. He was at Trailblazers, three Malaga in Euro, yeah. and six out in the NBA. I mean, that. And Ryan was helping coaching him. I Did mean, you know that, Mark? That's why I started no, with that one. No, I didn't know absolutely didn't one. know that. But yeah. Quite, even, like, if you had a three year, three years in the NBA, that's amazing enough to say, or oh, I, I had, a nine-year contract with the Blazers, three played Euro ball, and then six. I was in the NBA. Well, I mean, Good just friend. going to play in the ACB is an achievement. That's you know, that's an incredible. That's, that's the second best league in the world, no, no question. Or at the time it was. I, I'm not sure what the rankings are now, but I mean, just to have the career he did in the ACB is impressive enough. But then to break in, you know, there ain't, we don't have a long list of British people that go and play six years in the NBA. No. Um, so. He's, um, he's and he's a great kid as well. You know, not a kid yeah, anymore. He's a man. But I remember you always spoke very highly of him, not just as a basketball player, but as a, a person yeah. as well. You always very complimentary. So of him. every time he came back in the summer, um, he would always, you know, we we always. He's a celebrity. He's an NBA player. We wanted to talk to him and ask him how he was doing, and you know, is he going to play, and you know, all of that kind of stuff. And he would just be asking questions about everybody else. Um, you know, how are you? How are your parents? How you know? He's just a, a great dude, and from a great family as well. Yeah, so he deserved grounded. everything he got. Um, he worked really hard, did everything that Jimmy asked him to do, um, and then Jimmy gave him the platform, and he just sprung, you know, sprung from that. I I, I did hear when he was an NBA player when he would come back uh, to England, people would be like, "I just went down to summer league and Joel Freeland's playing, just played against an NBA well, player." Well, yeah, so that's a great story. So I, I don't know. He was playing for Gran Canaria at that point, so he'd been drafted, but he wasn't in the NBA. And we used to go down to the Portsmouth Grammar School and play in the summer league. It'd be me, Matt Guyman, a load of guys from Matt Guyman's age age group, 
and we used to win we were a good team so we used to beat all the local you know the local guys and every every summer we went on for a couple of years and every summer they teams would start stacking each other up to try and beat us because we never used to lose any games and um one summer it was getting wet every game every week it would be a completely stacked up team and alex had told me alex burner told me oh you know next week you've got a you've got a tough game the guys have created a team to come knock you off your pedestal and i said all right um that'll be good i obviously knew that joel was coming back and matt had been speaking to him and he's like i just want somewhere to play so he came down Brilliant. from farnham Brilliant. and uh obviously they yeah we were like warming up for the game and the other team's getting ready and thinking yeah we're gonna we're gonna knock them off and then joel walked in and uh just <laughs> absolutely destroyed it you know, his first like five or six plays were dunked but I tell you Will, do you remember Will Neighbour he used to play for Bow Hunt. he was a couple of years younger than Joel um, they used to play there used to be a Bow Hunt team at the uh, grammar school and Will was quite tall he's about 6'9 long arms blonde hair plays in the BBL now and Will had a really good game against Joel he played really well um, but I remember speaking to him afterwards and he was just like the man is just rock solid it's just you run into him it's like walking into a wall yeah well i mean at that point i mean just looking at the these stats um he is 6 11 248 pounds i mean that's not far off yanis right uh like weight wise oh i don't know but yanis is 7 but it's still that's that's i mean that, that's a strong guy he's a big dude that's a strong guy he's a big dude yeah but yeah. oh that's brilliant yeah, yeah, we got yeah that, summer that league. Brilliant. I mean, yeah, there's, there's, there's bringing player. in a ringer and there's bringing in yeah. a ringer, and I mean, you're just taking the yeah. mic out. Yeah, yeah, you know what? Somewhere in the world, someone's walked in with bloody Michael Jordan. Gone, yeah, we just got a new player, Jordan. No one's in. done that. And no, yeah, they have. You don't, would you yeah, want to play on a on a with Michael? Yes. No. Hey, look, with Fury take on handball and MJ's available for the Fury. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. I'm, I'm getting him in. I, I'm, I'll, I'll be the water boy, but I don't want to play on a team with MJ. No chance. Are you kidding me? Well, you could I get would. Emas- emasculated. He you? would. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I literally, we just put the clip up on the on the uh, Instagram of MJ from the last dance where he's savage. It's like, I'm passing you the ball. Pay attention. Oh, God. Bu- and he's just like, Mark, there are winners and there are losers. I'll be the loser. I'm quite happy with that. I'll be the ball boy. I'll say, MJ, what do you want? Would you like me to help you with your water? Not, there's not a problem with that, but I'm not touching the ball, catching a pass from him, or even daring to do that. No chance. It, you know, he would. He was someone who tested. Yeah. You're like, I, 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 if I'm giving you the ball, you got to do something with it. Do it wrong, right, you're out. I mean, we've said this about what Mick used to do with players. Like, you, you're gonna run. It's like, right, you've made a few mistakes. Off. Go warm the pine. That's it. You're done. Yeah, Mick. You miss a shot with Mick. Maybe one, mate. Definitely after two. Well, I, I suppose it depends on the player. Depends on the player. If if you are one of the more consistent shooters, then you would stay on. But if you are, yeah, if you came off the bench and you missed two shots, bam, sub. I mean, that's the idea. Good, of the good, coach, though, good game. You, see you, you, see, you spot like he's having a rotter. There's no, he's not moving right. He's not. The head's not there, whatever it is. Absolutely. You spot it, don't you? But that's why I always, and it was only in hindsight, looking back like years and years later, um, you know, when we were talking about the whole psychology of the game, is as a player, I remember there was so much more weight on that shot because I was like, I'm getting one or two, maybe three shots a game. So when I go to do that, there's so much more pressure on that shot. If If I'm shooting... 30 shots a game okay maybe it's not too bad if you miss one but that's why I think it'll be really good to get Steve back on talking about the whole mindfulness and psychology when we talk yep. about flow yeah absolutely I think we should get him back on and talk about that 100% but well, one of the things you actually mentioned when you're talking about youth players when we had Steve Davison on one of the things he talked about was uh, I want to say there's the parallel because of obviously trying to go over to the states etc but one of the first things he said was when you're a youth player, you got so much access to the gyms yeah. and getting in there and just 
you know, because you don't have families and you don't have all that sort of, you know, being yeah. an adult responsibility sort of thing. So the access you had to just go train and train and train and, you know, do the Kobe thing all the sort of time. Yeah. And is that, you think, sort of, honestly, the bit that you'd love to have seen him have that, that kind of access? Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I think... You oh, yeah, because you're saying he was one... No, sorry, two training sessions a week and then he had yeah. a couple with and Jimmy. Then, and then yeah. he would have a session probably once, a, you know, at the weekend, um, one-on-one session with Jimmy. Whereas doing going, post moves. Going to college and stuff and then saying, oh, you just in the evenings, so I just kicking it around. And do it. Yeah. Just having hand-on-ball contact and, yeah. and just game time. So, so one, of the, one of the best quotes I've ever heard Jimmy say is, there are, there are sponges and there are rocks. And Joel is a sponge. So he just soaks everything up. Any inf- bit of information you give him, you show him something, he knows how to do it. And some players, you show him something, you can give him all the attention in the world, and it just bounces off because they're solid and they don't soak anything up. You've played with Paul. Which one is he? There are, there are sponges <laughs> and there are rocks. It's the, it's the best quote I've ever had. It's so true. Hey, it's so know, true. Do you know what? He's I, avoided that question. He did. I, I, you know what? I, I can still visualize Ryan's face once. I remember there was this play we were, we were, we were uh, an offensive play, and I, I was getting confused with it. And I remember we had, I think we must have had two, three hours in a bus journey. I went up to Ryan. And went, Ryan, um, do you know this play we're doing? Can you just help me walk it? Walk, just walk through it with me. And he had this face of so much disapproval of like, <laughs> why the hell do you not know this already? And uh, he went through the basics and it was like, I was like, all right. How many of those plays stay with you? I mean, as a coach, do you, are they the ones that sit in the pocket? So as a junior, we used, so, so as soon as we got control of the ball, we, we had a play we ran. And it yep. was the same play every time. Um, there were multiple options off of it. But as soon as we got possession of the ball, we were in our offense. And it's the to this day, it's the most complicated offense I've ever been involved with, I've ever seen. I could run that now, like the back of my hand. I haven't done it in 15 years. Would could, you use that with anyone you were coaching? <sighs> That's what I always find interesting when you have a sort of coach and then a player... It's like when you have ex-players who then do coaching, how much they, t- obviously they take from their journey as basketball. Like when you were coaching the juniors, there would be certain things that you would have told them that Mick would have taught you that maybe you knew you were teaching them, but maybe you didn't. They were just parts that were instilled in you from your basketball journey, then go to someone else's. And so it keeps that going, doesn't it? Yeah. So obviously when I did move from pl- I was playing and coaching at the same time. But when I moved into the coaching space, we the whole program ran the same offense from under 12s up to under tw- under 20s. We were all every coach, every team was running the same offense. Jimmy's offense called break to shuffle, um, and we all ran it exactly the same. So when I moved into coaching, it was understood that that's what I was gonna that's what I was gonna teach. That's what I was gonna coach. And the premise behind the offense is all the drills you could possibly do for teaching people how to screen, how to cut, how to pass and move, how to it's all within the offense. So but if you go into like modern basketball, it would be viewed as very robotic because you go to a certain place, you make this pass, you you make this cut, you send this screen. Whereas now basketball is very much read and react. And if you you know I, there's probably pluses and minuses of both ways of doing things. Um, it'll be very hard, I think, in a modern basketball facility to run that offense because it's so much. Because the three point shot's worth so much now. Um, as much as I don't like it at times, it's, you know, ultimately, you know, if you shoot a high percentage from three, it's highly valuable. And we never used to shoot a lot of threes because we were probably played more of a 90s style of basketball where we were trying to get to the basket and try and score easy twos. Um, so... The mon- money ball effect, isn't it? Just, yeah. You've got to just jack as many things as you can up and the stats say if you hit enough threes, you win the game, that's it. Um, I, I would love to see what, you know, how that would translate now. 
um, how that sort of play and how that you know that level of teaching and coaching would translate now. But I'm not, sh- you know, in some respects, there were players that came through that program that were held back because they didn't learn how. I mean, I was a guard, so I had the ball in my hands a lot. There were players in that in that organization that weren't guards and and didn't have the ball in their hands a lot so weren't making those read and react decisions all the time does that does that make sense yeah. and particularly you guys probably know this being around junior basketball you get players playing inside at 13 14 that are never going to be playing inside when they're 16 17 18 you know they need to learn how to play on the perimeter because that's where they're going to end up playing and we didn't play that way. We had two guards, three forwards, and three forwards played, you know, inside. The best ones figured out ways of playing, you know, adding to their game and getting guard skills. But some of them learned to play with their backs to the basket and post up, and they're only ever going to be 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, That's not going to translate to, you know, high-level basketball. Does, yeah, does no, I know sense? what you're saying. It's, um, also, also, sometimes the other way around, like, I was... Um, helping coach um, National League under 12s and there was um, an under 12 kid who was 6'1 and I was very much like let's teach him fundamentals under the basket like under 12s you're going to kill it aren't you really Um, but there was a lot of trying to teach him the perimeter and I could get it but part of me was like look guys he's going to he's going to be a down low player Let's yeah. focus on that. But a lot of the focus is, you know, five out. It's so, take him out. It's so hard to, to judge because, I mean, obviously you've got to look at the genetics, look at the parents. If you've got, a, you know, parents that are six, eight and over six foot His dad's mom, a big guy. you yeah. know, then it's likely that he's going to be that kind of size and he's probably going to gonna need to be able to play inside. But even if you look at the high level of pro basketball now, you've got six, eight, six, nine guys handling the ball. They need to have perimeter skills. You know, that there's so little value to a 6'9 guy that can post up in, in pro basketball. There it just isn't. It's weird because we um, literally were having this conversation this yeah. morning. Yeah. Because I was the down low guy. Yeah. Because I was the, the, I grew early and that was it. He was the guard. Yeah. So then fast forward to when you guys were playing, he'd had ball time. But then he was playing low. Yeah. I think I was a, I don't know what it was. A small forward, I guess. Very small forward. But, yeah. But it's like that helped, but you can have it the opposite way where for me, yep. then I went, hang on a minute. Like what someone, like I'm no use to anyone now because I know down low. Yeah. I'm not a guard. I don't have the hands for it. I don't have the speed for it. I can punch someone in the face or I can <laughs> block someone out or catch a rebound, but yeah. That's what I learned from that young age. So yeah. It's a gamble, isn't it? Because yeah. you, you know, is that someone too high? Are they? What are they going to? And, and also, they're not just away from the game. You know, the the, the world, the life, but uh, their agility and that sort of side of things yep. as well. The fitness. Yep. Um, you know, Jimmy's whole thing with with break to shuffle was everyone learns how to play. So he, you know, you probably know from playing with me, Paul, that. I used to post up. I would catch the ball in the in you know with my back to the basket, and I could back people down and you know shoot over the shoulders and shoot jump hooks and score inside. Um, you know that's like a forgotten thing now for a five foot nine <laughs> guard to be able to do. You know it was quite rare even then, I guess. Um, so that was the the plus side of it, and that's why Jimmy was so good at developing big men. You know, that's why Joel became what he was. That's why Will Neighbor went and played, you know, in America and then and then came back and made a pro career elsewhere. But, you know, people aren't recruiting sub six foot guards for their back to the basket skills. Yeah. But could yeah. they could they switch it up? I mean, you, you know, you looked at was it Houston two years ago, they tried to do the small ball thing. I mean, and the the greatest example for me is at the moment is New York with uh, what's the little guard they just got across from Dallas. Can't remember his name. Yes, I do. Um, well, oh, you don't, Mark. 
Jalen Bronson. Jalen Bronson. Yeah. So he yeah, obviously that stocky. That weasel who left me. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, no, but you're he's not. No, you're not. You're still the Dallas top. You know. Are you a Knicks fan, are you? No, I'm not a, I'm not a Knicks fan, no. No, no one's a Knicks but, fan. <laughs> no, but I, I like his game. I liked his game at Dallas. I yeah. thought they were wrong to get rid of him. In you know, When you look at the finance side of thing, it was a stupid decision. Um, but... You know, he's he's a guy that can, you know, take advantage of mismatches with his back to the basket mm. as a as a, a point guard, essentially a small point guard. And the f- the flip side argument is because guards now are so focused on being able to defend people coming at them facing the basket. When someone posts them up, they don't know how to do anything about it. But, um, but you have someone like Luca, yeah, and he's six nine. You know, people forget he is a big dude. He's bringing the ball up. I mean, he's his court vision is outstanding. There's no question. But do you want him bringing the ball up? Well, he, I mean, he he I'm does st- take take advantage of mismatches though. I, I think with Luca, the biggest problem I have is the usage. You know, it's it just doesn't translate to the playoffs I, you know you've seen it with someone like James Harden and you know and now with Luca I mean Luca does play well in the playoffs you know you can't can't deny that um but is that are you going to win a championship with one guy dominating the ball that much I just I just don't think you can so this leads us quite nicely actually because we talked about like in that part of the history with seeing some youth talent and them going through to the NBA for the UK itself that trajectory to get there when we talked with Steve like the fact that he'd even got a, a, a ticket to go over to go into college and do something at college we were like wow but like that just wasn't done yeah so that pathway to get into the NBA which you know we're not going to go to the whole world champions thing but the NBA is the pinnacle of basketball as basketball players see it a lot of the time yeah well, that's the place you want to get to at some point. But for people in the UK and maybe European teams up until maybe the last 10, 15 years, that wasn't an easy route to no. get into that because it was set up for the NCAA and the drafts and that's how it was set up, wasn't it, really? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the I think you've said it on previous podcasts, the NBA game is so physical. It's it's refereed so differently, and and European players struggled historically with that physicality. Um, and so quite often the European players that did make it into the NBA were highly skilled. You know, generally bigger guys that could shoot on the perimeter and take mismatches. You know, and and create mismatch situations. Um, I think that's probably changing a little bit now. I think the European game is a lot more physical than it used to be. Um, and then you've got, you know, the, uh, for the most part, the European players are more skilled. Um, wow. You know, <laughs> I'm not necessarily talking about British players, but if you if you talk about, no, let's not the, you know, the, let's call it the Eastern Bloc teams, the Serbias, the Slovenias, the... Um, yeah. Lithuania. 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 Th- these guys have, you know, they, they can really play basketball. It's a national sport, isn't it? Yeah. Greece, Spain. I mean, Slovakia. At, at the Fury, there's been a lot of Greek players. France. And, France. and Spain. you know, going back to my previous point, these guys are getting their guys they know they're going to, that are going to be 6'10, 6, 6'11, 6, 7 foot. They're getting them playing on the perimeter when they're kids. So they're developing those perimeter skills when they're kids and then they get to be 6'10", 6'11", so, and then they start taking care of the match-ups and the post-ups and that kind of stuff. That's you saw that in the World Championships this, this summer. That's your Vucevic and those sort of players yeah. that you think, oh, he's a big, he's a seven-foot centre. Hang on, what, why is he outside? Why is he hitting it? He's, oh, he's hit the three. Okay. Well, yeah. Oh, you can do that. <laughs> oh, that, yeah. you know, what, how do you stop that? Then the Dirks and all those players who just set that benchmark, haven't they? But... We we talked about it on the last one about forty eighth was a uh, GB in the FIBA rankings. I, I think I said it was the football equivalent of Moldova. <laughs> and <laughs> I think that's how I, I should have phrased laughed. it. I should have laughed. And ironically, in the FIBA standings, Moldova is the bottom as well, which is weird. But it was just like 
why is GB basketball so low when it was the nine top nine teams, I think, Paul, that you you went through that were European? Well, that's, Out of the top twelve, well, nine I, of were I, European. We, we should look into it, but our, my assumption is when it comes to any kind of qualifications, GB are going up against in in this decent block. You, they're going up against Germany, France, Spain, Slovakia. It's, it's very hard Serbia. to qualify for for tournaments in Europe because there are so many good teams. Yeah. You know, if you're Australia, you've only got to beat New Zealand to qualify for the for the Olympics. That, that's, yeah, that's the situation. Um, whereas... Really? You, yeah, because it's done by... I, I mean, I don't know if that's I still think, the case. But, I think there's a few teams, but yes, there'll be a lot smaller countries than Australia. So you, you've, you've got to qualify in your own continent. <laughs> and obviously in Europe, there's a lot more countries. Yeah. Um, and, and that standard of basketball is huge across. So that's that's, that's the first thing. It's hard to qualify, as we found out in the lead up to 2012. You know, even as the host nation, it was, <laughs> it was difficult for us to qualify. Um, I think the fact that we don't have, or until you know, I, I'm not going to speak too much about the BBL because I'm not educated enough about it. But in, it's it's not a well respected pro league internationally. Let's let's just say that. Mm. Okay. So players that are good enough to go and play professional basketball generally don't aspire to go and play in the BBL. They want to, you know, obviously the, the leaving the EU and the contract situation for UK players is complicated things. But generally what people did was they, they left and they tried to play in Spain or France or Germany. There was more money. It was a more professional and a better standard of basketball. Um, yeah, the pay. Actually, yeah, that's a really good point. The, yeah. the actual your salary is going to be significantly more, isn't yep. it? Yeah, because they're, they're yep. respected leagues. So that so that's the, the other thing. Whereas if you look at someone like Spain, and I suppose that's probably an unfair comparison, but the majority of the elite Spanish players play in Spain because they've got a quality league there, and so they're all playing together year round, rather than with us in the UK or Great Britain we've got players some of them are playing in you know Turkey some are playing in France some are playing in Germany you know wherever and there are regional differences to the style of play and yeah. then we've got to bring that all together and try and mesh it into a team in a very short period of time and compete on, an, on the hardest international stage you know whereas in Spain they pretty much all play the same they wow. play pick and roll they yeah, you know, they play high low, they you know, they move the ball, they move people, and all the teams play a very similar style of basketball. And so it's very you know, I I don't know because I'm not involved in Spanish basketball, but perceptively it looks very easy to mesh those guys into a team to play international basketball. Mm. And even the Americans have struggled with that, as we've seen in in documentaries, and you yeah. know, they're all you've got guys that are used to having the ball in their hands the whole time. And then they go to the USA, you know, team and they, you know, Brandon Ingram barely touches the ball. He doesn't know, he's, he's not effective because he's, it's not a style of play he's used to playing. But they are ranked number one in the world now. I mean, yeah. They, you've got to be, you've should got be got changed to be. immediately. <laughs> after those world championships, that should be changed no, immediately. No, it was changed after the world championship. They weren't so, first and then now they are. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so they came fourth. You can't discredit you know, if I tried to discredit Germany, I'd get lynched when I got home because my my partner is German and she's uh, obviously really happy that the world championships, <laughs> the world champions at the moment. Um, and you can't, you can only beat who's put in front of you. I've, I always say that. You know, arguments of oh yeah, we didn't take our best players don't work. But if you if you look at it objectively, that USA team only Anthony Edwards would make the USA team if everybody. Yeah, hundred percent. If everybody was, you know, available to play, Anthony Edwards would be the only one that would make that team. And he played superbly. There's, yeah, there's absolutely played his socks off. But yeah, yeah, you're right. So yeah. until until you get those guys, I mean, the, the counter argument is Slovenia didn't have Jokic. Yeah, not not Slovenia. Sorry, Serbia didn't have Jokic. So, you know, he's in in my opinion has to be the best player in the world right now. Um, he's having a good time by the looks of it at, well at yeah, I, I, yeah I don't blame him I don't blame him <laughs> he's been on like a two month party but you know so if they didn't have their best player yeah. it's, the, it's the same argument but do you think 
um, for the Olympics, the Americans are coming? It, it kind of seems like they are. I mean, LeBron came out almost immediately and said that he was on board. Whether or not he's going to be in any shape to be able to do that, I, I've got no idea. Yeah. But what's it, 38 or 39 next year? I think, so. I think he's... I think he's 39 in December, isn't he? Yeah, I yeah. think he's 38 now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. No, oh, no, he's... I mean, he came in... No, he's older than that. He? he came into the league at 17. He's in year 21. So, yeah, he will be He will be 38 or 39 in in December. I think he's trying to get to 40, isn't he? And then retiring. Doing a like, VC. Like I was saying he's trying to wait for his son, aren't they? They're try, he's trying to wait for his son to make it in. That's I mean, what they're saying. That's interesting because it depends on who gets his son. Uh, there's, uh, so I follow or a lot of stuff at the like moment, <laughs> and there's, I mean, when, when you look, when you look at, you got to get him. when you think about the financial impact that LeBron has on every team he's been on, you know, even in year twenty-two, let's say twenty-three, if you're if you know you're going to sell out every arena that you go to because he's there, and you've got a second-round pick. <laughs> going that you don't you know that's probably going to be a failure anyway because it's hard to get a really good player in the second round wouldn't you yeah if you if you thought oh, so I'll draft him make LeBron happy get him here because LeBron's tied it up so that his contract aligns with when with when Bronny's available to come into the NBA he's yeah. done it on purpose I wonder if you give him a poor contract and say yeah sure we'll take you I'd, one I'd, million absolutely absolutely like a veteran. And for you know, if you're a, if you're a, a you know a franchise that struggles to make money or struggles to fill the arena or whatever, why wouldn't you? You know what? I think they're probably all looking at Orlando, thinking that's probably where they want to end up. Mark. <laughs> no. Yeah. no, they're gonna they're doing the whole Ohio thing. I think they're gonna pull that card out. Right. Let's we we've talked yeah. about the coaching and the NBA. Right. Let's get let's get on to Ryan and his career. So. I mean, Ryan, I thought I played, that was Ryan's career we were talking about. Well, it, yeah, it was a bit, you know. That's, <laughs> um, I, I met Ryan um, in the Ports of Smugglers day. So this was, you know, over a decade ago. And this was that team that was around for about, oh, I want to say five, six years, um, may, maybe longer. Um, and, you know, Ryan came into that team definitely as one of the leaders of that team, definitely one of the players we all looked up to. Um, for sure, but that was probably, you know, you had a, a a fairly good career up before that point. You know, you had a lot of stuff with the Solent Stunt, Solent Suns. That's the, the women's team. Yep, the Solent Stars. Correct. Um, yeah. And you know, there was that little stint as well with the the Reading Rockets. Yeah. So um, I suppose after my junior days, which you've already kind of touched on, um, I this where I got introduced to playing for Mick Byrne. So um, Solent Stars set up a, well, obviously they always had a Division One men's team, but Mick set up a Division Two, oh, sorry, a second team in Division Three. Um, and I tried out for the Division One team and I didn't make it. Um, so Alan Cunningham was coaching um, and he didn't select me. So I went to the tryouts and they didn't select me. Um, and there was a couple of guys on the team that they didn't select. So um, Clayton Milner didn't get selected. And then a couple of guys that I played with at junior level that had just somehow managed to turn back up to Southampton at the time and they tried out and they didn't. So one of them, Dave McKay, did make it. Um, he went to like the first two practices and left. Said I, I can't stand it. I don't want to. I don't want to play here. Oh, I'm wow. going. He he was living in sort of Andover Way, and he's like, it's, it's not worth me. I'm not going to get to play. I don't want to do it. Um, so Mick had obviously, I'd know, I'd known Mick from local league and different things, and obviously he was always around the junior program, watching and stuff like that. So we knew each other, but I'd never played for Mick, and he sort of reached out to me and said, come and play for me in the Division 3 team for the second team, so I'm going to start second team. Um, so I did that. I then recruited Clayton to come and play. Um, Dave McKay, who was looking to go back, I I brought him back in and then another friend called Liam Wyatt who now runs or is involved with the Bournemouth Bears team. Um, so we all played together at under 18, under 20s. 
Oh, right. Yeah. Actually, I, t- I just remember Mick's funeral. There's a one of the pictures we saw of you guys. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Liam for Bournemouth. He was in it. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then obviously Mick had a few of his local guys. So Andy Young, um, Jonathan Rumsey. Yeah, Rumsey. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. Chris. There's a guy called Chris. I can't remember. Craig his Dawson was on that team. Oh, really? Yeah. Craig Dawson was on that team. And then we had some juniors playing as well. Um, Joel played, you know, when he could, when he wasn't playing under 18, he played up onto the Division Three team. Um, that sounds like a strong youth team there, like a strong young team. Yeah. So, obviously, none of us really had any men's National League basketball experience. Um, but we were quite hungry and we all of us felt pretty put out that we hadn't been selected for the Division 1 team. Was that like you got something to we prove? Got, we got something to prove. And we yeah. used to play our games before the Division 1 men's team at Fleming Park. <laughs> um, but again, because it was at a time where most of the guys playing for the for the Solent Stars men's team, they weren't local players. They were all recruits from outside. So quite often, and, and we were obviously, a lot of us had all come through the programme, even the juniors that were playing would come through the Solent Stars junior programme. And so quite often we'd come to a game and we'd have three, four, five hundred people watching our Division 3 game. Oh, wow. Um, and we, you know, when it first started happening, we thought it was, you know, they would just come watch our game and then stick around and watch the Division 1 men's game. But quite a lot of them were all from the programme, all the kids from the programme with the parents and stuff. They used to come and watch us play. And because they didn't have to pay. The Division 3 game, you didn't have to pay to get in. As soon as the game finished, half the, half the spectators left and stop watching um so that sends a message that yeah. sends a message right and we there. weren't we yeah, weren't the... that popular because they weren't a great team at the time um they were okay but like you know obviously they'd been used to you know re- being really good um and we were well we won the league that year so division division three it was regionalized i think into three divisions uh we lost a couple of games in the league um but I got called into a meeting. Well, Mick asked me to come to a meeting halfway through the season. They, the, the, the committee for Solent Stars called a meeting. And it was essentially about junior teams coming in or ju- junior players not being available. Coming, you know, they, They've got this junior program underneath and the, the players aren't filtering through and playing for the pro team. And they were really after Joel. That's what they were after. But at the time... We, there was uncertainty around Joel playing with professionals and what that would do to his NCAA eligibility. Now it's a bit more clear and you can do that. But at the time, there was and there's NCAA rules that if you played with professionals, you were deemed a professional and then you couldn't play amateur basketball in the NCAA. But even in those days, the NBL Div 1, they considered that professional? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So Jimmy basically just kiboshed it and said no he's not he's not playing for the division one team um and obviously that wasn't popular because again he was you know he was clearly going to be a good player and was would be valuable for them so he they called mick in to answer for why the junior players weren't available and then mick asked me to come in so there was probably 20 people in the meeting and there's a load of people talking and i was sat at the back and listened and then eventually like it got to a point where you know everyone could sort of volunteer information and Mick stood up and said I've got somebody that wants to talk and he sort of pushed me forward um to which I said we're not we're not professional basketball players we we play basketball locally for our local club because it's fun and we want to you know, we want to play basketball with people that we like and we enjoy playing basketball with. You're not giving us money. Um, a lot of us are paying. Although you, you probably already discussed this. Most of us weren't paying because Mick was paying for it all himself. Um, and, you know, you can't tell us where we're going to play. If You know, firstly, you didn't want us on the team in the first place. You didn't select us when we tried out. You said we weren't good enough. And now suddenly, because we're doing well in Division 3, you've changed in your mind and you want us to come and play. Well, we've got our own team and we're happy. And that was kind of how it 
how it ended. Like mic drop. Where, like, <laughs> yeah. At the um, end. And you know, if you try and make us come and play, what? How are you going to make us? We just won't play. So, you know? how many of those play- players from Div Three do they want to go up? Uh, well, they wanted Joel, obviously. Although Joel didn't play that much for us because he was obviously committed to the under 18s. Um, Clayton, they wanted Clayton, and they wanted Dave McKay back, but Dave didn't want to play anyway. I, they never, they never made any noises that they wanted me to play. Um, so I, I couldn't, could don't know. I hope you don't mind me asking this. Why did Mick ask you to go in that room? Is that because you were just gonna? Were you the leader of the prob- team? Were you prob- just going to yeah, say it so, as it was? So, yeah, so I was running the practices. So Jimmy, uh, sorry, Mick would let me run the, the practices, um, set out the offense, set the defense. You know, I was basically player coaching the team and Mick was then during the practices and then in the games, Mick would run the bench, call the timeouts, you know, all of that stuff. Yeah, um, this makes sense. So this is why Mick, by the time you got to the smugglers, Mick's got the respect yeah. that we could all see yeah. that he had for you at that point. Okay. Yeah. So, so and and at that time, I was, you know, probably quite vocal about what I thought was right and wrong. And, you know, I, I was already a coach myself um, and knew, you know, knew that I felt put out by the way that, all of us had been treated by not being selected for the team because we thought we were better than the guys they selected. Um, so he wanted me, to, I guess, to have a voice. I'd never asked him, but that's just my assumption that he just wanted me to be able to voice my frustration about the whole situation. And I've really appreciated it, to be honest. Yeah, get it all off your um, chest. Yeah. Um, how do you think hindsight now, if you had been picked, how do you think you'd done? I don't think I was ready. I don't, I mean, I, I, cause I ended up playing for that team and we'll get to that in a minute. I ended up playing for the same team a couple of years later and, it, and I struggled. Um, I mean, like I said, I'd never played men's national league basketball. So jumping straight into division one, I will say, I didn't think I was going to go in there and play 25, 30 minutes a game. I, I, I was fully aware that I was probably going to be sitting on the bench and coming in and playing two or three minutes behind the, you know, the guys that have been playing there the whole time I thought I just thought I had earned a spot on the team and they didn't even think that um, but I, I wouldn't have made any difference to the re- the final result of the season in my you know I wouldn't have been able to maybe Clayton would have because Clayton was you know more physical um, you yeah. know he'd been playing with men when he was 14 15 you know in Zimbabwe yeah, so Mark, just for your information, so Clayton, a guy called Clayton Milner, he also played for the Ports of Smugglers when Ryan did. Um, yeah, just, oh, I mean, he's probably, I want to say he was top three scorers every game, almost certainly. Yeah. Um, he was just, you know, big guy, quick, inside. I mean, yeah, he was just a strong guy. He's yeah, just man. one of those guys, so he was about 6'3", you know, maybe 6'4". But played like he was six eight, really strong. Um, just again, real clever around the basket with his footwork and his touch, and just being in the right place at the right time. I always remember really he had a, a great, um, like a great shooter, especially around the key. He was just yeah. always a solid shooter inside the key. He's got that ball; he's free. It was going in. Yeah. Uh, so Clayton probably could have could have made an impact to a degree, but. They just weren't that great a team. And in Division One at that time, you needed two really good Americans and then a really quality British supporting cast. And I just, they didn't have it. Um, you know, just didn't have it. So I don't, I don't think it would have made that much of a difference. Um, but yeah, we, you know, that season we we won the league. Um, or the, it was like the Division Three Southwest, I think we were. No, Southeast. Sorry, Southeast because we were playing against London teams. Um, upset some pretty good teams went through to the you know to the playoffs we played a team from Aston that had three ex-BBL players on it and they were sort of thought of as the team that was going to win it all and we they came down to Fleming Park they, they, 
they were a much better team at home than they were away. So they didn't finish strongly in their league because their BBL guys were only really playing home games. But they they came down for the for the playoff game and they thought they were going to beat us and we beat them by about twenty points. It's interesting in that mentality, isn't it? Where are oh, we won the game before it starts? How much of an effect that has? Yeah, especially if you're the opposition, knowing that. Yeah. Um. So that that was one of the best games, and then I think that was the semi final, and then we played uh, played at Rivermead in Reading, the Rivermead Leisure Centre for the final. And that was against what, Derby Trailblazers, who are in Division One now. Um, they were an up-and-coming team like us at that point, um, and we lost by two. Um, Ouch. And it haunts me to this day. Oh, really? Oh, uh, that that's that still haunts me too, because that's the best season I've ever had. Like the best, most fun season I've ever had, because it was a bunch of guys that I really liked. Played great basketball. We had people watching us. Um, it was kind of my coming out party as a men's national league basketball player. I, you know, people started to recognise that I was a good basketball player, um, and we were the best team, and we lost. I, I, t- I turned the ball over two times in a lot. I'd, I'd had a great game, um, and then the last two minutes of the game, I turned it over twice, and they they scored both times. We were up going into the last two minutes, and yeah, haunts me to this day. I, I still wake up in cold sweats about it now. So you putting that you putting that whole loss on you. So <sighs> that that's that's big. That's, that's so tough to say. That's all on you. It's, yeah. It's a team. Um, so after the game, um, I was on the, the the bench by myself. I can't remember where everybody else was, but I was on the bench by myself, and I had my you know my head in my hands. I was devastated. Um, and Jimmy was watching the game and he came down and he sat next to me and he gave me the best like pep talk so first of all so first of all he said because one of the passes I threw that turned that, that turned over hit the person who I threw it to in the hands so it wasn't like I just threw the ball out of bounds it was like 10 feet away from somebody I threw the ball it hit him in the hands he, he didn't catch it it went to the other team they went and laid it up and he said the ball hit somebody in the hands it's like it's not like you threw a terrible pass he, he, he was able to catch it he just didn't catch it so that was the first thing that he said and then he told me a story how and I don't remember when it, when it was but obviously Jimmy's like a legend in the game but in the 70s he was playing for Crystal Palace and he missed a free throw in the national championship game to win the game so he had a sad free throw at the end of the game um, to win it, and he missed it. And it was on the national newspaper of him missing. Um, and he just said, "It happens, you know. It's just part of the game. And what do you what do you do from now?" And if he hadn't said that to me, it probably be even worse how I feel about it now. But it still haunts me to this day. What what could have happened? Yeah, because I, when you sorry wow. to interrupt Paul when you look at where so Derby Trailblazers went up into Division 2 went up into Division 1 they're now a well established Division 1 professional basketball team and what what could have been if we were if it was the other way yeah I, see, I mean it's that yeah but, but do you think it could be the way you have that leadership role that you because I remember a few games where you took responsibility for a game I always remember you know that leader you were the one of the only people turn around and go that's on me guys I remember you did that for a few games which is very similar to what you're saying now yeah um, but I mean I that I don't know I've never character. asked the guys I, I'm still really close friends with all those guys on that team particularly the guys I played junior but like you know Clayton's I'd go into any game of him. You know, he's my best teammate ever. Um, I don't, I've never asked them, but I'm pretty sure none of those guys look at that and say, do you know what? That was your fault. You turned the ball over. Yeah. But you um, as an individual, you, yeah. you're thinking, well, I missed that one jump shot and we lost by two. If that jump shot gone in, we'd have won. So that's more of a, you trying to be, you know, better yourself. 
Yeah, no, so it probably speaks to the, what I was, what who I was at that time as well. So you know, again, Jimmy was like, you you can't be a point guard if you turn the ball over. You know, if you turn the ball over more than three times a game, you're not you're not a point guard. Um, and so that that was like my attitude about everything. You know, I, I can't turn the ball over. I've got to be safe with the ball. Um, and I hadn't turned the ball over the whole game. And then the last two minutes, I turned the ball over twice, and we lost. It was devastating. It's de- it was absolutely devastating. I mean, um, sometimes you just have the right voices around you at the right time when you need to. And, you know, obviously, uh, I don't know it's Jimmy, but, um, you know, the, he was the right character to yeah. give you that talk because he's... He's run, probably the only run, person I could have listened to at that point. Because he'd it's, run through yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, you could have had yeah. Nick Anderson, maybe. He knows a few things about <laughs> missing free throw, but, yeah, I mean... So, like, so because you lost the playoff final, did you not get promoted then? So, again, it was complicated. And I think we had... So, so this is on the very outskirts of my memory, but I seem to remember having a a conversation with Mick um, about where we're going to take promotion to Division 2 because we had the choice if we were going to take promotion. And at the same time, the whole regime for the Division One team had changed. There was a new coach going in there. And they'd approached me and asked me to play for the Division One team. And I, Mick had asked me, you know, are you going to come back and play? And I said, Mick, I've been asked to play for the Division One team. And he said to me, you should play for the, you're good enough to play for the division one team you should be playing in division one so it was kind of a mutual decision that i did that clayton did as well liam and dave both left um and the team stayed in division three for i think one more season and then might have been two more seasons actually and i played i played in division one for two more seasons um, and then Solent Stars folded yeah and and the very next season the smugglers started that ties yep. up with what so, I remember yeah so so, so I yeah. must have been playing for the Solent Stars Division 3 Solent Stars 2 team then because I remember I played the last season before it folded yeah and I'm not saying this disrespectfully at all but we were a poor team just we just didn't have a team yeah um and i think it was like eight players maybe nine yeah. players and we were getting beat most games and then Sony stars folded yeah and then the smugglers happened so yeah so i'd so the last season at solent stars division one we, so, tr- so Southampton Trailblazers had set up a Division 3 team. So Mark Jackson and a load of the guys from the Division 1 men's team had set up a Division 3, no, Division 4 team with so- Southampton Trailblazers. And so, That's right. Yeah, the Trailblazers. So with, um, Sylvain Dono was the coach. Yeah. Um, and so, so that opened up the opportunity for me to get a lot more court time and take more of a prominent role in the Division 1 team um, the team hadn't made the playoffs in quite a number of seasons before that and then we had two Americans come in we had a pretty solid you, you know British base around us and we made the playoffs for the first time in a long time we, we were eighth so it's, we took the last playoff spot um, and then the t- you know, we lost to Werther in the, in the first round Werther were by far the best team in the league Worthing Thunder, um, we lost to them, and the team folded. The, the you know Silent Stars folded. Um, so what 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 happened to the Stars and why did it fold? It was just financial, or I I, I believe so. So the guy that sort of the owner of you know the team, Bob Pauly, you know, I, I understand there there wasn't enough money. We weren't getting a lot of crowds at that point. Um, you know, it was just not financially viable for him. From from what I, I don't know the full details behind that, I didn't get involved. 
I suppose it's difficult as well when you've got the trailblazers there as well. You potentially yep. splitting your audience, aren't you? Yeah. So, and, and uh, with the trailblazers, a lot of them were local guys as well. So, so you had people wanting to go and watch that. They didn't have to pay money to go and watch trailblazers play. Um, so, Solent Stars ended. I'd got to the point where I'd had a pretty good season. I'd, I'd had a knee injury during the season, but I'd, I'd played pretty well. I was the captain of the team. Um, and we made the playoffs for the first time in a long time. And then it folded and there's no Division One basketball. Um, and that's where I'd kind of strive to get to. And it just wasn't there anymore. And then up comes Mick again. And you and you then go to the, the peak of your basketball career, walking into Portsmouth College. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so Mick obviously set up the Portsmouth Smugglers National League team. That was in Division 4. At this point... I think we were just behind the Trailblazers, so they'd got promoted, haven't yeah. we? So we were like yeah. behind them all the That's time. That's right. So that that last season of me playing for Solent, Trailblazers were in Division 4. They got promoted, so they were in Division 3. And then Solent starts folded. We moved into, you know, a lot of the guys that were, you know, local guys that were playing for Solent then ended up playing for Mick in Division 4 for Portsmouth Smugglers. So and that's how that whole thing started. And I remember that first season, one of our future best players was going to be Andy Ong. Um, and I want to say he start, he went to Bogner. Because in when we were in Division 4, I'm pretty sure we played Bogner against Andy. <laughs> and then he... Um, Jumped back. Transferred to Portsmouth Smugglers. Yeah, I don't know. Was it, was it you who broke the guy's ribs at the end of the game? Can you remember that when we played Bogner? No, we, it was a it was a tied game, and Port Portsmouth get the ball, smugglers get the ball, fast break, three, two, one. Guy Bogner guy sets a charge. Guy goes up, smacks into him. The guy moves, so charge isn't called. Scores the layup. We win the game. Guys fractured two ribs. Remember that? No, I don't remember. And it that. was in the change room, and later someone said, "Yeah, he's fractured two ribs there." I don't. I don't remember which year it was, but I remember playing Bogner. I want to say it must have been in Division Four because that was so. So that season, I I was the MVP of the Division Four. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, when we played Bogner, it was a really close game, and when no, they, so this wasn't a close game. The one at that I'm home, talking. we killed them. Yeah. So that's the game I'm talking about. Yeah. So in that, that's the best I've ever shot the basketball in that game. So I, I wasn't known as a three-point shooter at this point. I was a pull-up jump shooter from 15 feet. That's that's what I did. Um, but I don't know what happened. I was just in the zone, I guess, on that day. Um, and it was at Mountbatten Centre. And we had um, all of my junior kids that I was coaching at the time were all there. None of them had ever seen me play. And they all came to watch the game. And That's they were up on cool, like, the balcony it? at the top watching the game. And I scored 37 in the first half. I literally didn't miss a shot. I've, I've, I literally did not miss a shot the whole first half. Hero mode activated. I, I mean, it was <laughs> one of them watching where, you. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I came in the first couple of minutes of the game and hit my normal sort of pull up twos. And then, you know, with every shot, every basket, you, the, the kids are just going crazy. And then, obviously, I'm the point guard, so I'm bringing the ball down the court. And they're just egging me on, like, shoot it, like, crossing the half court, shoot it, I'm pulling up 30 footers, and it was, it was just going in. Wow. And, um, you know, it's one of them games where the coach is trying and everything he can to try and call you off. you got them throwing people at you different you know sub sub that guy out he can't guard put somebody else in just to face guard him and it just didn't make any difference and I, I scored 37 in the first half and the game was over they just were just completely demoralized and um i didn't even know like I, you know i was so in the zone i didn't know what the situation was and i barely played in the second half i played like two or three minutes i think and then Mick brought in which he rarely ever did brought in the second five and um, 
And I went into the change room after the game, after we'd won, and it was one of their players that said, you know you scored 37 points in the first half. And I said, no. So I've got no idea. Are you serious? He said, yeah. It's 37 points in the first half. Finished on 37, didn't score another point in the game. Wow. Um, but well, it's by far the best I've ever shot in a game. Oh, well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for letting me play in the second half by your <laughs> first half performance. <laughs> you know what? I just remember you always being consistent. So I, I can't... I don't remember you scoring 37 points and a half no. because you scored... You, I knew, you're quite, in the teens, probably. But you're, teens. You, but you're always contributing. So I kind of just think, oh, yeah, Ryan's going to be one of the scorers, you know... Clayton, Steve, yeah, Harry was it Harry Vesey? I think his name was Harry Vesey. Yeah, um, he came in Division Three. He wasn't in Division Four. He didn't play in Division Four. Oh, okay. Um, At least I don't think so. Andy Ong, obviously. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think who else there was. Lawrence, Lawrence, yeah, Rowe. Lawrence Rowe. Yeah. So one um, of the games I, I can't remember if it was that season, but I, I, I think you talked about it on one of the other podcasts, and he came in and he and he did the similar thing. He came in and scored like thirty-two points yeah, in the first half. In yeah. the half, yeah. But can you remember Mick said to him at half yeah, time? Yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah, I remember that game vividly. Lawrence, no one scores thirty-two points in my team. <laughs> Something like that. I, I want to say it was Andy, but oh, we I were struggling be to beat that team. That we, that, and he came in and they were playing a zone and we just couldn't knock a shot down and Lawrence came in just exploded, and just didn't went it? off yeah. yeah and just broke the game open for us I remember he, he, he hit a three hit three hit three and they weren't getting out and then all of a sudden he started then driving in yeah I want to um, say that was London Towers I want to say it was London Towers was that was at Mountbatten as well but yeah he got I, mean, I want to say he got injured really early on in the second half though Yes, he I think did. He scored two right. points, then got injured. You're right. Um, but yeah, so we, so yeah, we, we won the league. Won the, again, it was a regionalised league, and I've won the MVP. I can't remember what happened in the whether we went to the playoffs or what what happened. I can't remember. We we didn't win. Um, I don't oh God, remember. I can't remember. You know, for me, it was just like a. A ride. I was just sat on the yeah. ride, holding on to a couple of capes, just enjoying the show. That's how I always look back at it. Um, but yeah, I can't remember about playoffs. I mean, the only playoffs I remember were later on as we went up. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so that was that. Um, and in Div 3, we, you know, uh, yeah, so maybe Harry so going. We, so we, we got, got promoted. So we got promoted, but I didn't play the next, well... So I didn't start playing the next season. So that was my season or half season at Reading. So again, so you had the opportunity to play Div One again. Again, yeah. So I was chasing that Division One dream, if you like. Um, and I can't remember how it came about, but I remember having a conversation with Bev Guyman, and sh she knew that I wanted to play, you know, to a higher level. Um, and Reading. We're basically getting rid of one of their, or yeah, getting rid of their point guard from the previous season. The team chemistry wasn't working, that kind of thing. And she talked to the management at Reading and said, you know, what about Ryan? Um, Who again? They knew me because I'd played against them in Division One, and I'd play and I'd coached against them with the with the junior teams. Um, so they knew who I was. Um, and they invited me up there for like a, a summer run playing against their guys. And it was Dave Titmus was coaching at the time. So he kind of like was just watching the session, watching how things were doing. And I I sort of went back and forth with their American at the time and sort of held my own and tried to defend him, even though he was really good. Um, and at the end of the, the, the run, they said, if you want to come and play for us, we, you know, we don't have anyone that oh, well. does what you do. Um, so, yeah, come and play. I was living in Southampton at the time, working in Christchurch, um, and then traveling three times a week up to Reading to play for them. I didn't get, you know, I didn't get any money or anything. I was just doing it off my, you know, my own back. Um, so I, I did that to start the season. They had a great team. It was Tintin, you know, David Tintin Watts, you know, went all around Division One and the BBL, one you know, great basketball player. And that's the season where they 
didn't lose a game. So they went undefeated in the in the league, the cup, the playoffs, everything. They won everything that year. Um, but I I got to about October, November, and it was just killing me. I wasn't playing a lot. Um, I was coming off the bench. This is from Southampton, so you're travelling to Reading from Southampton. Yep. Yeah, that's for training. Yep. That's going to be quite hard. Um, he gets another shell station very well, don't you? Yeah, it was costing me a lot of money in fuel um, to go to and from. I mean, I spoke to so one of the guys was the team captain, a guy called Richard Wellens, who's on the um, was on the GB Maxi team with me. Really gr- great guy, um, and he was talking the management into sort of giving me some expenses, money to help me sort of cope with the financial side of things and keep me on the team but time wise it was just it was just killing me and I just couldn't do it um, I plus, think a lot of players go through that don't they yeah and you know to some to some degree I regret it because I could have been part of something pretty special but I, I wasn't playing I was you know I was coming off the bench 8th, ninth, 10th man off the bench they were trying they were doing the right thing for their programme they had some really good up and coming junior guys coming through that they were trying to you know trying to get some division 1 experience I was probably marginally better than those young guys um, I probably deserved if you just looked at it like that like more, more court time but they were trying to invest in their own youth which I, I completely understood you know I'd want to want a you know, Southampton based team to do the same thing to be honest um, so I stopped and thankfully I did it in time so that I could transfer so I transferred back to Portsmouth to the sacred landmark transferred yep. back to the the blue blue army rescinded the passport stopped being a northerner yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. I, I can't, back to the coast I can't remember I, th- I want to say it was Div 2 or Div 3 I want to say Div 2 but at a certain point we got into the same league as the Trailblazers it was Division Three. Were you back for that? So my when I left Reading and came back to Portsmouth Smugglers, our first home game, well, our first game was against Trailblazers. Oh, okay. But it was at Mountbatten Centre and gone. So I was just going to say, talk me through, you're playing at one level yeah, and then you come back to play at a different level. Oh, what's that transition like? Yeah, what is that like? Do you Did you think when you came back, I feel more comfortable here or did you think I, I can cause a riot here Mark um, I think I think he walked saw me in training and went I'm glad I'm back that's what I think the answer is he brought the Michelin man of training <laughs> <laughs> I mean <laughs> so there's a few things so <sighs> I'd always strive to play at that division one level that you know i'd never had any aspirations of playing in the bbl or any higher than division one i you know i came through a junior program and that was like playing going to watch solent stars on a weekend was the the highlight of a weekend um and that's that's what i wanted um so it was disappointing to kind of every time i got to that level not be able to sustain it for you know for a career um so there was an element of you know this is like a step down um, but I always got to be me. Whenever I went and played for one of those other Division One teams, I was kind of always trying to prove myself to somebody. And and you know, I've got to be a set it up point guard, or I've got to be I've got to be a scorer, or I've got to be this, I've got to be that. And when I came and played for Mick, he just wanted me to go out there and be me. He trusted my judgment, you know. Um. So it was fun. And at that point, because I'd spent four months, it was just a slog of, you know, commitment and, you know, commitment to your body, commitment to, you know, practice, being on time, um, driving, you know, it was tough. Sometimes I was literally showing up for practice five minutes before practice started because of how long it took me to get there. Um, And... It was just fun to play with people that I liked, people I, you know, enjoyed playing basketball with, and and Mick let me be me, and that's, I suppose, there's a dual story here. I was always potentially trying to get away and trying, to, you know, play at a level that was beyond where Mick was coaching, but also, I always came back, um, because 
it was it felt like home i guess yeah did sense. you yeah did you ever um i don't mean this the way it, I, I <laughs> it comes across nice did you ever mick ever ask you for money not once <laughs> I don't think he took. Can you remember the trade so that Leon a, paid? I, no, I, I heard the story though, but I, I no, I don't remember. He that. turned up with it was the, like season hadn't started, and he turned up with five hundred and fifty quid. And Mick was like, "Look, Leon, well done. Everyone, give him a round of applause. He is, you know, a model S- player. This is what you should be aspiring to doing this." I, so <laughs> no one else did. So the the season we played the the, the Solent Stars two season in Division three. Um, it was kind of like an an unspoken. So I I went through half the season believing I was the lucky one that wasn't paying, and everyone else was paying money, and it was like thirty five pounds a month I think at the time. They, and and they did all the whole meetings about it's supposed to be thirty five pounds a month. You need to you know you need to pay on time and all this. They did all of that, and Mick never spoke to me about it. Um, and I did, obviously didn't pay. And it never it was never brought up, and I just assumed I was the only one that was getting away with it. And it took us until probably January, February, and we even mentioned, you know, even going into that meeting with them saying we're paying our own way and all this kind of stuff. We'd all, you know, we'd made the statement that we were paying for our own basketball. And then me, Dave, Clayton, Liam are all like, "Are you paying? No. Are you paying? No." And we literally <laughs> went around the whole team and nobody was paying money. So how he was doing it, I don't know. Could be the reason why Solent Stars went went bust. I don't I know. Think, I, don't I know. think Mick was funding a lot. Yeah. I think Mick, well, I, I remember I, I think it was either £20 or £50 a month we were supposed to be paying. And I think I paid it up to maybe Christmas. And then when I found out half the team wasn't paying, I'm like, why, uh, why, why should I Why am I, I paying, paying, yeah. Like, you know... Um, <laughs> Yeah, but legitimately, but, there's you know there's some teams that just wouldn't have existed, you without, know, without if, without, without, yeah. without him doing that. Yeah, there's, you know, I I completely believe that. Um, because there were people that couldn't afford it, couldn't have, couldn't have afforded to pay. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, um I make you yeah, Mick carried the teams financially. Yeah. I think. Um, I do talking about the Trailblazers. I do look back at one of my personal favorite games was against the Trailblazers at Fleming Park. That was Jackson's retirement game. Yeah. Yeah, I was there. And I remember, I, I, um, who was it? I remember they gave him some big award. Yeah. And someone just went, they're giving him an award. Like, come on, yeah. use that, mentally use that. And I you guys beat him, yeah. 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 So were you playing that game? No, I was watching. Oh. I can't remember why. I can't remember why, but I was I was stood behind your bench. I, I was in I was in street clothes. I can't remember for what reason I was injured. No, I tell you what it was. I rolled my ankle in the season, and I was out for about six weeks. And it was at the end of the season. Oh, okay. I remember yeah. we won by two. I think we won by two points. It was like quite yeah, a low a scoring game. game. Yeah. I want to say it was like yeah, sixty six, sixty eight, or something w- like that. I was happy about that too. But um, the, the one thing I, I, I looked back and uh, and just liked about it, I had a bit more court time than I normally would have, which was nice. Um, but I just remember the crowd seeing Portsmouth and Southampton people mixed. Yeah. With, throughout, because it was both. It was I think it was at I mean, Fleming Park. Both bleachers were yeah. out. And then when we won, I just remember jumping on Andy Ong to celebrate and. There was, there was no nothing. It was like, all right, they won. Half the people clapped, half the people didn't. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a rivalry game. It was intense, but there wasn't any nastiness or anything like that in amongst it. It was a, it was a good natured game, um, and that's, that's what four it's points that game up. Career high, and one was on the uh, uh, by the baseline free throw. What was the highest amount of points you've scored in the game? National League. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it was 14. And I, the only reason I remember that is because Steve Davison um, mentioned that the top three scorers get put on a website or something yeah, like that. The Basketball England website used to, well, England Basketball as it was at the time, I think. Yeah, and he said, um, you know, th- th- this is what happens. And I was like, 
man, I just want to get oh, in that's, that top that's the three red bag to the ball for you once. Yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah, look, I'm not going to say I was an overly great player, um, but what I do remember is knowing that and thinking when I come on, I'm going to try my hardest to get someone like Clayton the ball or someone else, and I'm going to try and facilitate. And I remember putting so many picks on for people thinking, I look back now thinking maybe I should have been a bit more selfish. But I remember one game in particular, Steve said that, and it was a bit of a red rag. And I just went, right, I am I am being selfish. This next game, I scored 14 points. And I, I remember even getting the ball, getting past someone, and from the halfway line, and I think it might have even been Steve was in front of me. I was like, there's no way I'm passing you this ball. No way. <laughs> no way. And it was 14 points. And Steve, he messaged me and took a picture or something like that. And went, I was third. Like, there we go. <laughs> Boom. But I, I think the team ended quite soon after that, I think, from what I remember. But we had some good games. I mean, we had the the um, the, a couple of cup runs as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember your name ruined my speech once. Your surname. <laughs> yeah, you've got to tell this story. So this, was this Div 2 or 3? Would have been Division 3. So we're at Division 3 and um, I think it was a cop, com- a, a cop, it was a cup competition that went higher than Div 3. Like we were, we were doing well, wasn't it? I think, wasn't it Div 1 as well? Oh, I don't remember. I, I don't I, remember. No, I remember. It was, it was the final of the, of the trophy, I think it was. So, like, I guess, like, the Carlin Cup yeah. equivalent. So, yeah. I think... It was at Manchester. We weren't the highest league, put it that way. So, we got to the final and we were playing Brixton. And Mick took us all up the night, the day before. Yeah. And I think we had a meal together. We had a few beers, something like that. And Mick wanted everyone to give this speech or just say something. And I, I always remember Ryan, he was saying don't finish the game regretting something that you haven't tried your hardest or something like that. I visualised because you were sat to my right. I can still remember you saying it. And um, everyone kind of went around. And it got to me, and I just thought, I'm just going to say something funny um, because these guys are a lot better than me. Why would I try and say something say yeah you need to try and do inbound pass i thought let me just take say something funny so i went with pain sucks chicks dig scars glory lasts forever i thought brilliant but as soon as i said pain sucks i've got ryan Payne sat next to me so i went pain sucks what what, what are you talking about so, hang on so i had to change it to physical pain sucks <laughs> chicks dig scars glory lasts forever and they're like oh, okay cool thank you paul see you later sit back down thank you but, um, who let him out it was from a film it was that American football film I saw yeah, like, the replacements the night you before threw, so. yeah you threw me off my speech because that's what that, at the time that was a really like favourite movie of mine were you going to say the same thing no I wasn't but it was a bit too corny for me but <laughs> but no you threw me off because I wasn't expecting anybody to break that one out but um, yeah I think I was the last one no you weren't I was oh were you yeah uh, maybe yeah, I remember sitting yeah. next to you. Um, but yeah, no, and then we had the cup final the next day. I mean, I think one of the things you just mentioned there, I always find interesting is how you've mentioned about you have playmakers and you also have like players who play specific roles, yeah, and they're there, you're here to do something, yeah. And you've brought it up Paul, a few times with Paul, the mix come up to you and be like, right, you go in there and you annoy the hell out of that guy, like you become the irritant for him that number that's it don't focus on anything else just that person there yeah and that's what i liked about mick he was very he i think mick for for me he managed me and my expectations well so he would say to me good earl you're going to come in this game to give clayton a rest that is your role or someone and you, you just got to go good out. You got to work your ass off for five minutes. If you do well, you might stay in longer. And but that, so I went in thinking, my job is to let Clayton have a rest, and and I, I can get three fouls or whatever. But um, then he'll take a different approach with it, and that's the, the coach's skill, isn't it? Yeah. Knowing not what I need to do strategically, but how do I get what I need out of that specific player? Yeah. To make this all come together. 
Yeah. But there were, I think there was lots of mature players in that team and everyone seemed to gel well in the sense that they knew what their role was. They knew who the scorers were. They knew who the players were going to be working hard. If yep. someone turned around and said some advice, like if Ryan says something mixed, like, right, fellas, listen to what he's just said. So it was a, it was a intelligent team is probably how I'd phrase that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, it's something I always cringe at a little bit when you hear pl- like disenfranchised or you know whatever word you want to, you know, players say I don't know what my role is on the team um, f- because for me every good team I've ever been with that that doesn't result from the coach or someone on the team saying your role is to you know set picks or knock down threes or whatever those relationships happen you know ergonomically if you if you like is that the right word i don't know you know it's it's evident from the way that you play what your role is on the team if you're on a team searching for a role and you need someone to tell you what your role is on the team then you don't know what kind of basketball player you are you know what what are your strengths what do you bring to the team find a way of making those strengths a strength of the team I've I've never sought out a coach to say you tell me what you want me to do or you tell me what my role is on this team. Like I know what you know what strengths I bring to the team, what value I bring to the team. I don't need someone to tell me. Um, maybe that's you know a, a strength of mine that I know what my value is, or you know, and some people don't have that. I don't know, but it does make me cringe a little bit when people say. I don't know what my role is or coach won't tell me what my role is. Like, find a role for yourself. Create yeah. a role for yourself on the team. Bring value to that team. You know, anybody can go out and, you know, try and stop a good player from scoring. Anyone can get tracked down loose balls or, you know, learn the offense and know where the next pass is supposed to go. There's things you can bring to the table. That's not always fun. You know, that's not always glamorous. That's not always where you get all of the pundits and, you know, people praising you as a great basketball player, but it's it's where you get people wanting to be your teammate. Dennis Rodman. Yeah, absolutely. Barely made the score sheet, if ever. Yeah. But probably... The ultimate guy that knew his role. Yeah. Knew, knew what he was there to do. Like Didn't he... need anyone to tell him what no. to do. But arguably one of the best rebounders in the game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, totally. and just did the agitation thing. Was a, a physically a massive guy, and, and, and knew yeah, where not, where not, he had to be. Didn't need the direction, but then Phil had to manage him in a different way. Yep. I'm saying Phil, like I know him, but he had <laughs> to he had to manage him completely differently to. Yeah. And then you have someone like MJ. You, have, you know those to to bring something like that together. Yeah, and I know what you mean by players because I mean. I, I do remember when that squad started, there were a couple of players like, I want court time, I want this. And it's just like, just shut up, do whatever you need to do for the team. Like, if that I, is... I, I've always maintained there isn't a coach in the world that just will cut their nose off to fight. If I don't, I, you know, I don't like that player. So that player is going to bring value to your team and make you, you know, capable of winning games. The coach is going to put you on the court and give you what, give you the court time. You've got to bring the value to that to that situation. You know, if you're going to make yourself a nuisance and be in the coach's face asking for court time you don't deserve all the time, like you deserve everything you get. Yeah. So that ends this episode of the Portsmouth Basketball Podcast. Part two of this interview will be coming out in 24 hours. So tune in for that one. But until then, wherever you are and whenever you're listening, we thank you so, so much for your support. Till then, bye-bye.